and a very good day to you and welcome, welcome to the program. As you can see, we are standing outside. It is a beautiful autumn day here in South Africa. Behind us, we've just made some bales of hay for the winter time because the frost uh, burns off all the grass here. And it's a great day just to have a good talk with you. I want to speak to you today about a band of feet washers. That's right, feet washers. That's what Jesus was. He was a feet washer. And I want to say to you, the feet that he was washing, <laughs> they weren't nice feet. They were stinky, dirty feet. Some of those feet were full of betrayal. In fact, the one man's feet that he washed, as soon as he had finished washing his feet and drying his dirty feet with a towel, he said, go and do what you have to do. And with that, Judas Iscariot got up and went out and betrayed the master for 30 pieces of silver. Now, it's hard enough to wash somebody's feet that you don't particularly like. How do you like to wash somebody's feet who is about to stab you in the back? That is what we are talking about today, being servants of the Most High God. You know, I want to say to all the pastors and evangelists like me, we must never forget that the word minister, it's not an elevated uh, post or service. No, the word minister literally means servant, a feet washer. We are not the big shots in the church. We are the servants of the church. I know you know that, but I just had to remind you because I have to remind myself constantly as well. It is a great privilege to be a servant of God. A great honor to be one of his feet washers. He says, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Have you ever washed anybody's feet? Oh, yes, I've washed many feet. But you know, the hardest thing for me is to have my feet washed by someone else. Very humbling, isn't it? That's happened to me on a couple of occasions as well. So if we go straight to the Word of God, and I'm reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 13 and verse 8. You know, just before this program, I was having a chat with the film crew, and we were talking about the importance of Scripture, the importance of the Word of God. Now, these programs are all based on the Word of God, not on uh, Sigmund Freud, or on Albert Einstein, or even William Shakespeare. No, they are based on what Jesus said and what Jesus did. So what I want to say to you, you might say, Angus, I'm not interested in your opinion, and you're quite right, you shouldn't be. And by the way, I'm not interested in your opinion either. And I say that with great love. <laughs> but what we are interested in here is in Jesus' opinion. So now Jesus was sitting around the table, the Last Supper, okay, the night that he was going to be betrayed, okay, and they were having a meal together. And I prob I'm presuming that they were arguing about who was going to hold the main position in the church and who was going to have the, the top spot. And Jesus never answered, did he? No. He got up and he went and got a basin. He filled it with water. He took a, a, a towel, he wrapped it around himself, and he went and he started systematically washing the disciples' dirty, stinky feet. And when he got to the main man, that's right, Peter, the one who the Lord said, you will continue with the work when I go. You'll be the head of the church. He was about to wash Peter's feet. Now, let's see what Peter has to say about it. John chapter 13 and verse 8. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Now, that was quite adamant. That's typical Peter, eh? a bull in the china shop. Impulsive, but absolutely dramatic. You shall never wash my feet. But look what the Lord said. 
And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, if you don't humble yourself, Peter, and allow me to wash your feet, I don't want anything to do with you, and you will have nothing to do with this ministry. And of course, then Peter, typical, <laughs> okay, Lord, wash my whole body. The Lord says, I don't have to do that. You see, he was doing this to show the disciples how we, you and me, sir, you and me, madam, how we are supposed to be in the world. We are a band of feet washers, okay? We are not trying to climb to the top, not at all. The Lord says, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. If you want to be first, you must be last. And this is a mindset that is 100% opposed to the system of the world. In the world, you teach your children from small. You must be the best. You must be first. You must go for it. You must study harder. You must train harder. The Lord says no. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must become a feet washer, a washer of feet. That's why Mother Teresa is so revered in the world. Mother Teresa, I don't know about you, I've never ever heard her preach one sermon. I've heard many sermons from a man I aspire to and look up to. I'm talking about Dr. Billy Graham. I've heard uh, sermons from men like C.H. Spurgeon. I'm talking about men of the caliber of um, A.W. Tozer. I've heard all their sermons. I never heard one sermon preached from the mouth of Mother Teresa. Why? Because she wasn't a preacher. What was she? She was a feet washer, a washer of feet. She was a school teacher, remember? She looked out the window, she saw the poverty in Calcutta, she asked permission, she went out into the streets, and all she did was she took people who were dying, lying in a sewer, an open sewer, maggots crawling all over them, dying. She went and she touched them, and they even said, how can you touch me? I'm, I'm, I'm putrid, I'm dying. I'm, and she said, because Jesus loves you. And she took them, her and her ladies, and took the bodies of these people into their little humble abode and washed them, that's it, not just their feet, the whole body, and put them in between two clean sheets and let them die with dignity. That's all she did. Do you know anybody more famous in modern days than Mother Teresa? And I'm not talking about uh, denomination and I'm not talking about any background where you come from. I'm talking about a person. I want to say to you, Jesus says, in as much as you've done it. And it's not easy, folks, especially when you have to wash the feet of people who are betraying you. That, I want to tell you, is very tough. And that's something that uh, I think you can only do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Pride is a terrible thing. I want to say that to you, and I'm not just talking to men. I am talking to men primarily because we have the biggest problem, but ladies do as well. Young boys, young girls, pride is a terrible thing. You know, God resists the proud, but he gives grace, undeserved loving kindness, to the humble. Okay, you'll find that in 1 Peter, first book of Peter, chapter 5 and verse 5. You see, We've got to understand one thing. Soon as you elevate yourself, God can't use you. Okay? Do you remember? I, I remember it clearly as a new Christian. One of those old hymns that have stood the test of time. It goes something like this. The first verse was, all of me and none of him. The second verse goes, some of me and some of him. And then the third verse says, all of him <laughs> and none of me. Isn't that a beautiful hymn? I can't remember all the other words. There was quite a few verses, but that touched me as a young Christian. You see, unless we die to self, pride gets, gets a hold of us. And I'm talking about men that God has used powerfully through the years. Men who have been able to command congregations of thousands. And the next thing you hear he fell. He fell, by the way. And that breaks my heart, by the way. Every time I hear that, I weep. 
You know when Jimmy Swaggart, the great uh, gospel singer, when he fell, they tell me that Billy Graham went into his bedroom and he locked the door and he stayed there for a long time and he wept and he said, Lord, if a man like that can fall, what chance do I have? I think it's as long as you remain humble, it's the safest place to be. You know, when, when you get on your knees, I'm going to get on my knees right here so you can see. When you're down on your knees, right, you're on your knees, you can't fall any further. Okay, but when I'm standing on top of the, that top rail of this fence, okay, on my pedestal, it's very easy to get knocked off there. And that's why we humble ourselves. I want to tell you a little story about myself. When I started preaching, the Lord said to me the one day, he says, you're too proud, Angus. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm not proud. He says, okay, I want you to, I want you to bend the knee before you preach every time. <laughs> I'm saying, now, but Lord, do I really have to do that? No, you don't, but I want you to do that. And you will find I will never preach a sermon without first getting on my knees, okay, taking off my hat and praying, Lord, I pray that you'd watch over the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, for we ask it in your precious name, amen. And I'm just quoting scripture. And I think you'll find that in Psalm 19 and verse 14. Now, I do that because when I'm down, there's only one way I can get up, okay? But when I start prancing around the, the stage like I'm the main man, I'm going to fall. And if you can do one thing for me, I've never asked you for anything, sir. I've never asked you for anything, madam, never on this program, ever. But I'm going to ask you for something now. I'm going to ask you to pray for me that I will never fall. Only by the grace of God, I will never fall because there are great men, men who I have esteemed, men who I've respected and looked up to have fallen. And I'll tell you what it is. It's because of pride. Nothing else. You know, Lucifer was the most beautiful angel in heaven. Lucifer was the choir master in heaven. But Lucifer got filled with pride and he started to think that he was as good as God. And the Lord would not tolerate it. And he cast him out of heaven, him and a third of the angels. And the devil is bound for hell, for eternal damnation. And what has taken him there? One thing only, pride. Remember what they always say, pride always comes, that's right, before fall. So when you are proud, be careful. I want to say to you, keep humble. You know my wife, Jill? She's my best friend. We've been married now just close on 50 years. And I want to tell you a little story. Sometimes I'll have the privilege of speaking to a very large crowd. Maybe a rugby stadium, a football stadium. And there might be 50, 60, 70,000 people. And I'll preach my heart out. I'll be sweating. And I'm, I really mean it. And after I'm finished, I'll say to Jill, just trying to get a little bit of, <laughs> just a little bit of acclaim. I'll say to my wife, Jill, uh, Jill, uh, how did I do today? And she'll look at me <laughs> because she loves me. And she'll say, Angus, God was very good today. <laughs> And of course, she was quite right. It was nothing to do with me. Keeps me humble. And because she loves me, she makes sure that I stay there, right there. Not being unkind, not being untrue. We need to understand something. Pride is one hell of a thing. And I'm not swearing. I'm using the word carefully. We really need to do that. You know, it starts from when you're very young. I have 11 grandchildren. And when they were all very small, sometimes I've got eight boys. Can you believe that? Can you imagine them all sitting in a, in a line? In fact, we've got some photos of them sitting on a rail. And when they're very small, you'll see them trying to put their shoes on. Okay, I'm talking about two, three years old. And there's little William, or maybe it's uh, Tyler, or maybe it's Nathan. And they're trying to tie their shoes in a bow. But they can't do it. And you come up to them and you say, son, can I just help you? And what do they do? 
They push their hand away. Don't they? Yeah, that's right. No, no, I'll do it myself. And of course, after a while, he can't do it. And then he asks you, Kulu, that means uh, grandfather. In Zulu, Kulu, can you help me tie my shoes? But initially, he wants to do it himself. So where am I coming to? Well, I want to tell you that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. humble. And I want to say to you that often, often, when you fall, okay, and you say, gee, so-and-so has just lost his farm or so-and-so has just lost something of value, shame. But you know something? That uh, so-called tragedy sometimes is a lifesaver. I remember driving around my farm as a young man and I had a young minister, same age as me, in the pickup with me. And he said to me, you know, I'll never have a farm like this. And I said, why not? He said, because God knows my heart. I said, what do you mean? If I had a farm like this, Angus, I would forget God. And God knows that. Isn't that amazing? Now, I want to tell you, I know of men who have got to the top of the ladder only to fall very, very hard. But often when they've fallen, is that's when their ministry and their life really starts. I'm thinking about Charles Colson. Charles Colson was President Richard Nixon's right-hand man. He was the number one man. He was an attorney, obviously. They said he was the sharpest mind in the world. He personally advised the President of the United States of America, Richard Nixon, the most powerful man on earth, on what to do. But they said he was ruthless. So ruthless that he got a nickname. They called him the Hatchet Man. That's right. They said he would walk over his own mother's grave to get to the top. And what happened? The Watergate scandal broke out. Richard Nixon was called to account. He started telling lies. Eventually, they impeached him. He was chucked out of office. And he should have gone to jail. But you see, they've never put a president of the USA in jail before. So who went to jail? That's right. The, the hatchet man went to jail. Charles Colson was sent to jail because the president was not allowed to go to jail. And in jail, he was in a proper full-scale penitentiary with all the nonsense and rubbish that goes on in there. And he was brought down from the top, right down to the bottom. He was humbled. He says it himself. He wrote a book called Born Again. He said he met Jesus Christ in prison. And the Lord stripped him of every bit of pride that he ever had until he had nothing left. And then when he eventually was released, after he had served his, his um, sentence, he came out of jail and he started the prison fellowship ministry, which went right around the world. Charles Colson has now gone to be with Jesus. And I have no doubt that he is sitting very close to the Lord. Why? Because he was humbled. Why? Because the pride was taken away from him. Another proud man was the Apostle Paul, who was actually called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was arrogant. He was proud. He had a mission. His mission was to, to kill every Christian he could see. He thought he was doing the right thing. And Jesus took him to task on that road. He was knocked off his horse. And a voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So why are you persecuting? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. And that was the turning point in his life. Saul wrote very clearly in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3 and 4. He said, I rejoice in my tribulation. He said, tribulation worketh patience. Patience, character, and character, hope. He knew that through the turmoil he had been, God had humbled him. So I want to say to you, sir, listening to this program now, I want to say to you, madam, watching this program, don't be disheartened because you're going through a hard time. There's nothing like going through a hard time to humble you and to bring you right down to your knees so that God can raise you up. 
And that's why he washed the, the disciples' feet. And that's why he said to uh, Peter, if I can't wash your feet, I don't want anything to do with you. I want to say to you as we're starting to close now, we need to check our hearts today. Is there any pride in your heart? If there is, then you need to ask the Lord to take it away. You know, I've never met a man in my life worth his salt who has not been through fiery trials. I've never met one. And this is it. These here, as one cowboy western said, these aren't wrinkles. <laughs> these are war maps. This is battles that we've been through. Times not fighting with other people, with yourself. It's either the Lord or it's you. And it's back and forwards until eventually it's just the Lord. And that's when your ministry, your servant status really starts to operate. When a man is arrogant and he's proud, God will see to it that he is humbled. You don't have to worry about it. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. The Lord says, ask and it will be given to you. He says, seek and you will find. He says, knock and the door will be opened for you. All you have to do is ask the Lord. Just ask the Lord to give you grace. Folks, I want to say to you, and I'm, I'm talking particularly now to young men, a young woman, please don't say to me, I want to go and sow my wild oats. And when I've had a bit of fun, then I'll come to the cross to the Lord. It might never happen. And it'll come at a tremendous price. I know what I'm talking about. God will forgive you, but the scar will remain on your heart forever. So if you've made that girl pregnant and she has a baby and you don't get married, every time you see that child, you'll remember what happened. God will forgive you. And she might forgive you. And that young baby might forgive you. But I tell you what, the scar remains in your heart. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, every single one of us has got that uh, selfish streak in us. Taking it my way, getting the most I can, taking advantage. Lord, please forgive us and heal us, Lord, and deliver us. You've said in your word through your servant Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect through weakness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. So, Lord, I thank you for the weakness, the weak times in our lives, which brings us closer to you. I pray for my friends today, every one of them watching this program, that they'll understand that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'd keep us humble, that we can become feet washers for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Until the next time, may Jesus bless you. Goodbye. Thank you for watching today's message by Angus Bucket. We trust that you were blessed. For more information about Shalom Ministries or upcoming events, please visit angusbucken.co.za. Have you downloaded the free Uncle Angus mobile app yet? You can enjoy more messages like this, as well as exclusive content direct to your device. See you next time. Goodbye.